The year is 1992. The place is Laredo, Texas. A high school football player is graduating, not only from high school, but from selling dime bags into working for the Beltran Leva brothers, who had a huge operation along the Mexican border near Laredo. How did a Texas high school star become one of the most wanted men in the hemisphere? His name was Edgar Villarreal, but he was already becoming better known by a high school nickname, El Ken the Kindal, or as he became to be more famously known, La Barbie. What is your name? Edgar Valdez Virreal. How many years do you have? 37. Do you have any name? La Barbie. Now, young Edgar was probably not raised to be a gangster, as far as we can tell. In fact, one of La Barbie's six sisters is actually currently a Texas state prosecutor. At her brother's 2018 federal sentencing, she told the judge that she and her siblings were raised by humble, hardworking parents who taught them morals and values. Apparently, those parental lessons didn't stick with little Edgar, because by the time he graduated from high school in the mid-90s, he was meeting operatives of the Beltran Levi brothers working in Laredo, which wasn't surprising as narcos were all around during the time NAFTA was making getting products into the U.S. easier and easier by the day. So how does an American high school kid get swept up into the world of narcos? I'm sure it was all very easy in the beginning and violence-free, just easy money. An interesting social component of the business is the process of foreign importers getting connected to the kind of Americans who can move major weight and be trusted with consignment and not to tell. And that's hard to do if you're a foreigner, and that's why Edgar Villarreal probably uh, grew so fast and, of course, the major distributors for a lot of the Mexican drugs smuggled into the country are uh, local black kingpins and La Barbie was very good at making friends with them. He started off trafficking green from Laredo and La Barbie soon made some strong relationships with important black dealers in New Orleans and especially in Memphis. His guy in Memphis was named Craig Petty's and I did a whole story on him. You can check it out in the link below. Before long, young Edgar was regularly shipping 150 to 180 brick consignments to multiple cities at once. By the late 90s, he was sending 5,000 bricks of coke and 10,000 pound loads of green across the border in one fell swoop. As things started to escalate, La Barbie was getting more and more in with the Beltran Levi's. He started living mostly on the other side of the border in Nuevo Laredo, and he may have gotten in really good and started moving up the ranks by becoming a Sicario, a hitman for the Beltran Levi's, who were part of the Sinaloa Federation. The phrase Mexican cartel conjures up different images uh, for different people, but what really is a cartel? Let's go back to 1979. The top dealers in Mexico who dealt mostly in marijuana and some heroin, as these two products both grow there, were all concentrated in Mexico's second largest city, Guadalajara. Felix Gallardo, Carlo Quintero, and Ernesto Correa put them together into a system that became known as the Guadalajara Cartel. The definition of a cartel is this, an association of manufacturers or suppliers with the purpose of maintaining high price and restricting supply. And that's exactly what the cartels did and do. What's going on down in Mexico is uh, probably a little different than you think. It's much less about individual kingpins who control an organization from the top down than it is about a system. And uh, integral to that system, more than anything, is political corruption. And Mike Levine was one of the most highly decorated DEA agents in history, and uh, he worked some massive cases in Mexico that were undermined by 
the federal government, the CIA specifically, and he also lost a former undercover partner under very mysterious circumstances similar to what happened to Kiki Camarena, who's uh, kidnapping, death, and murder at the hands of narcos and possibly elements of the U.S. government uh, was the key note of the whole final season of Narcos. Yes, yes, yeah. So, uh, you know, I've worked... Tell, tell, I've worked. tell us about the Kiki, what you know about the Kiki Camarena murder and well, how the Kiki, really... Well, the biggest, Kiki Camarena was uh, arrested, picked up by uh, cops, state cops, outside the consul in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, brought right to the traffickers who began torturing him over a 24, 25 hour period, tape recording the torture until he was dead. Um, the uh, cover up for those murderers went right to the top of the Mexican government. The, the, it was so bad that Dwight Von Raab, the head of customs at that time, just went to war himself because the, uh, our government wasn't backing up this agent. He was outraged. And he started searching everybody coming in from Mexico. So it, just, it basically stopped all com commerce between Mexico and the U.S. Uh, Not for long. At that, then Congress got, got him and, and said, you can't put up proof, shut up, because he said they're a bandito government. And so Dwight Van Robb went back to his office and he put out an alert to all his enforcement I want proof that this government is a bandito government. That's when David Wheeler heard it. That's how Deep Cover started, the whole book, the whole of the Operation Trifecta. All began with the Camarena murder. When DEA agent Kiki Camarena was murdered in 1985, the pressure from the American government was intense. In 87, the leaders of the Guadalajara cartel called a meeting of top traffickers in Acapulco to divide up the country into a system of plazas. Plazas are basically the right to control and the responsibility to protect through violence and corruption the various smuggling corridors into the U.S. In 87, the Ariano Felix brothers got Tijuana, El Chapo and others got Sinaloa and the Pacific Coast and etc. How is it? How is it Chapo Este en una junta. El último que dio el control, Arturo, eh, quedó que quedaron de acuerdo que, que los Zetas iban a hablar nomás con Arturo y que Arturo iba a saber algo, Arturo lo iba a arreglar. The extreme violence of the 2000s has been about different groups of traffickers fighting other groups to control both smuggling points, like the Tijuana San Diego border crossing, and access to customers. <sighs> There were a lot of dead bodies in Mexico, for example, about who was going to be selling to, say, the Flores twins up in Chicago. And that was one of the things that caused the Beltran Levaz and El Chapo to fall out, and La Barbie was central to that, but more on that later. Okay, say if a group controls the plaza in, say, Ciudad Juarez, it often would work like this. A guy wants to make some extra money, and so he goes to the Sierra Madre Mountains, purchases opium from the farmers there, and has it turned into Mexican mud heroin. He then takes it up to Ciudad Juarez. He gets in touch with the Juarez cartel, who controls the plaza, and he makes a deal with them to either let him smuggle his stuff through, or sometimes he might give it to them in Juarez and they owe him. So the narcos running the plaza are responsible for bribing law enforcement, protecting your load, and delivering it into the U.S. The cartels produce and send their own loads as well, but many of the narcos are fairly independent in general as long as they use and pay for the existing smuggling routes. So during the late 90s, El Barbie was just a guy uh, paying to use the uh, Nuevo Laredo, Laredo Plaza. These twin cities are by far the biggest land port of entry into the U.S. There's massive traffic, which makes smuggling illegal goods very easy. The infamous Los Zetas started in Nuevo Laredo around the same time that La Barbie was rising in the world of the narcos and he would go on to lead a war against them. When young Edgar came on the scene, the plaza system was running peacefully. Smugglers were paying about 60 grand a month to use the plaza, and that's what uh, Edgar Villarreal, aka La Barbie, was paying in the mid-90s. 
Then he got exempted from paying the fee, probably because he was a hitman. And by 03, La Barbie had become very important on the violence side of the narco world. The Beltran Leva brothers, who he worked directly with, uh, were at the center of the Sinaloa Federation, was at, which was at the peak of its power in the mid 2000s. Now, La Barbie uh, had been working as an assassin, or maybe just a commander of assassins. Where he learned his tactical skills or his brutality, hard to say. He was put in charge of the paramilitary wing of the Beltran Leva organization called Los Negros, or the Black Ones. His job was to take Nuevo Laredo from the Gulf Cartel and the Zetas, who were the Gulf Cartel's enforcers, before they broke off on their own. Now, La Barbie failed to fully take over his hometown and to destroy the Zetas, but the Zetas went on for a time to be the most feared group in Mexico, and the fact that he was able to conduct relatively successful campaign against them and that he almost took Wavel Laredo from the Gulf Cartel was really sort of a feather in his cap as far as the other narcos, El Chapo, the Beltran Leva brothers were concerned. It was quite a feat to be able to go toe to toe with the Zetas. His reputation was cemented as he matched the Zetas atrocity for atrocity. It's hard to imagine how he became so brutal so quickly given his seemingly typical American childhood. Makes you wonder. And according to the federal government, he was shipping from Mexico into Atlanta and Memphis on the back of trailer trucks, 300 kilos twice a week. That's 2,500 bricks a month, which would have uh, made him able to supply, let's just say for frame of reference, multiple big meaches. His number one customer was Craig Petty's. Uh, who's related, I think he's the half-brother of DJ Paul from the Triple Six Mafia. And during the uh, first couple months, I think of 05, which is right when BMF was going down, um, he sent Petty's alone like 1,500 keys in Memphis. And that was just one customer though, his biggest. And Petty's actually went, ended up going on the run and him and Barbie were so close, he went and lived with La Barbie down in Mexico and they got, uh, I think when, when La Barbie's political protection was starting to weaken, that's when Petty's ended up being taken into custody. So Big Meech wasn't able to go hide out in Mexico. Maybe he could have, but he didn't want to, who knows. Um, but Craig Petty's did and he hit out with Edgar Villarreal, AKA La Barbie. Now La Barbie was probably even more important as the planner and executioner, no pun intended, of violence for the Beltran Leva brothers and the Sinaloa Federation. The people that he had to ban the Zetas were like, uh, they had all been former Mexican military and special forces, so you can think of them as almost like a Navy SEAL. So imagine going against a rogue element of the Navy SEALs in a drug war, and that's what La Barbie did. How this Laredo High School football player came to be such an effective paramilitary leader is, is quite a question. And if you really read uh, in detail everything that went on between the Zetas and Los Barbie and El, La Barbie's um, Los Negros, I mean, La Barbie is the one who really, I mean, is more so than them, elevated the entire level of violence in Mexico. In fact, um, when things really started to get dark and bizarre, when they started uh, putting videos of guys he was the first one to do that. There were four assassins sent by the Zetas to get him in Acapulco, and uh, they caught two of them, and they put them on camera and videotaped them as a message. And that was La Barbie, and that was the first uh, narco killing to uh, go viral, so to speak. And and then everyone started doing it. So so this this. Uh, Handsome, fresh-faced kid um, who looked like a regular all-American boy. I mean, as much as anyone in Mexico itself, he was responsible for elevating the level of uh, brutal, dark violence in the narco wars. And La Barbie brought more than just violence in his skill set. He uh, waged a masterful public relations campaign. Uh, he placed newspaper ads, he paid for editorials to denounce the Zetas, and uh, like I said, he made the first viral video. 
Now, LaBarbie was now a top player in the narco system. But in 2006, new Mexican president Felipe Calderon launched an assault on the narcos. LaBarbie, when he knew the heat was on, he started reaching out to the DEA to try to work a deal. Word on the grapevine was that the Laredo DEA office was looking for someone highly placed that could help them capture El Chapo and Alfredo Beltran Leva. So LaBarbie felt the heat on himself and decided to try to make a deal. But he overplayed his hand. He told the U.S. he wanted to bring $6 million in cash with him, free from being seized, and he wanted his cousin to get out of jail. And the problem was, you know, he was sending drugs to Atlanta. He was sending drugs to Texas. There were murders in different places. So there were multiple jurisdictions they could have charged him. And uh, it was just going to be too complicated. So he ended up, he got taken into custody in Mexico and he was trying to work a deal. And he sat in custody in Mexico for five years and before he finally got extradited. And by that time, uh, you know, five years in custody, your information is old. He couldn't give up smuggling routes. You know, he probably had some information for him, but not enough for him to get much of a deal. His lawyer at the time, Michael McCrum, said, quote, the agents wanted to work with us, but we hit roadblocks in the upper levels of the Department of Justice because there'd been too much publicity about the video of the filmed executions of his would-be assassins. For a lot of people in Mexico, he symbolized an American criminal bringing a new violence, new level of violence to Mexico. Now, it's ironic, and this is a different story, but you know, the, the violence in Mexico, most of it is only possible because of guns. And where do all the guns come from? They come from us. So the flow of guns into Mexico is just as important as the flow of drugs out of Mexico into the U.S. But you don't hear much talk about that in the American media. Después comienzan las envidias y se volvió a tener la guerra. Pero con el Chapo. Uh, as an interesting little aside, La Barbie and El Chapo were briefly in the same prison together in Mexico and they worked together to orchestrate a hunger strike. So anyways, La Barbie gets brought back to the U.S. He can't really work a deal. Um, the, the federal case is ultimately brought against him out of the Atlanta Federal District Court, which includes the Memphis area where Craig Petty's his biggest customer was at. So the only reason LaBarbi finally did probably get brought out of Mexico is because El Chapo escaped and the U.S. government realized how insecure the prison system was for those high-ranking uh, narcos. Who knows, El Chapo might have helped LaBarbi escape if they had left him in there too long. So they bring him up to the U.S. He gets um, tried out of the Atlanta Federal Court, which also covers the Memphis area. They seized $192 million in assets. I don't. I, yeah, I think they actually got that much from him. Um, and uh, he ended up getting 49 years in prison. Craig Petty's his biggest customer, I think, got nine life sentences. Uh, LaBarbie was not convicted of any murders in the U.S., though he's probably responsible for, maybe not personally responsible, but his war with the Zetas might have cost a thousand deaths. I mean, I think 150 of his direct Sicarios died. So in June of 2018, Edgar LaBarbi Villarreal was sentenced to 49 years in prison. The U.S. attorney said the majority of the coke on the streets of Memphis and most of that whole region could be traced directly back to LaBarbi in the early and mid-2000s. He could have got life, but the prosecutors only had him get 49 years. That was probably his little bit of payback for whatever little bit of info, information he did give them. 49 years instead of life is the deal the gringo narco got, which doesn't sound like much of a deal to me, but we'll be able to walk out of prison theoretically sometime in his 70s, or maybe like Big Meech and, and, and other guys will end, end up getting out early. La Barbie, it's hard to know if he was just a young, regular guy down there in Laredo who got kind of sucked in by the money. And then before it was, uh, before he knew what was happening, he was in the quicksand of violence. But he sure took to it well. And uh, 
makes you wonder. I don't know anything about his family other than what the official story is, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a little more to the Villarreal family than has come out. But that's the story of Edgar La Barbie Villarreal, Al Prophet Los Drogas Americanos.